I'm so thankful you joined me. You're laughing because I've been talking like this off air and you know, you just connect with your guests randomly and you've never met them before a day in your life and all of a sudden like you become besties within two minutes. That typically ends up happening on the Mike News show where like these notables I don't know and they're becoming besties with them for like 30 minutes. And let me tell you, Jamila and I are best friends already. I'm coming <laughs> to her house with a bottle of wine with me, her and her husband. I think she may have a dog or I don't quite be sure, but I'm going to bring treats for the dog and we're going to enjoy. And Robert Battle has already <laughs> treated me like I'm a principal dancer on the Ailey show. It is the verse of amazing. <laughs> I didn't know my Zoom password. He was like going off. I'm like, Robert, <laughs> chill. It's not an eight count, buddy. It's not an eight count. <laughs> that being said, yes, all that happened off air. Uh, but that being said, uh, welcome my two fantastic guests uh, who have produced this incredible documentary, uh, Ailey. Uh, the director is joining me, Jamila Wignod, and the artistic director for Alvin Ailey, Mr. Robert Battle. How are you both? Great. Very well. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I am so excited to be in conversation. Uh, Jamila, as you, as someone who saw Ailey in college and just fell in love with them, um, it is for me, audience, a part of my yearly to-do um, is to attend the album and Ailey Gala um, in December and then also to attend the Spring Gala. Um, and so I do both and to see uh, these performances are like any other that I've seen before. It absolutely blows me away at the sure artistry of the dancers, both the athleticness uh, and the gracefulness of it. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing some of the cat, uh, the, 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 the troop, I guess you say, Robert, excuse me, I'm not the dancer, but uh, mm. the ensemble, what do you guys call yourselves, Robert? The company, the company, Jesus, company. The, company. Yeah. the company, um, including one of their principal dancers you have right now, Jackie. Uh, I am a huge fan. I know he's not dancing anymore, but Clifton and Center Man, like just blows me away. Um, every time. If I didn't see Center Man the Galas, I was always upset. But of course, you guys always did it. Thankfully for yeah. that one. Um, so with that being said, Robert, talk to us about why you feel now is the time. And of course, there's been other projects done on the legacy of Alvin Ailey, obviously. But like, why now do you think it's important uh, to tell this story in the incredible way that Jamila did? Yes. I, um, thanks for that introduction. I'm I think people are looking to be inspired. Um, they're looking for something to to lift our spirits and gives us something to hope for. And that is one of the best through lines of Alvin Ailey's work, his choreography, his dances. They uplift people. Um, they have a certain kind of humanity embedded in them that celebrates our common humanity. And it's a wonderful opportunity uh, for a company that's over 60 years old. Uh, you know, at this time, I mean, Alvin Ailey died in 1989. And you know, after the death of a legend, often we can't tell myth from reality, you know, because of that pedestal. Um, and so this kind of makes you understand his own vulnerability, his own ethic, work ethic, that he had to really struggle to make this happen. And that's inspiring to see what this one man with a vision was able to do. And now we're still living in that legacy. And so this is, I think, the perfect opportunity and the treatment of it, of his story uh, uh, by Jamila, I mean, I think is, is, it couldn't be a better kind of document of this legendary life. Yeah, and, 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 and with that being said, I forgot one more part that I loved about this documentary. Well, I really thought about why I love the documentary, but the mere fact I got a chance to see Judith Jameson for dance and perform, I, I, I've been a huge fan, but I've just have never seen her work. I just knew the legacy of her. Um, yeah. But I've just had just never seen any archival footage. And so to be mm -hmm. able to see her dance and to see her dance uh, in tribute to the piece that's about his mother and celebrating his mother was so profound and, and so powerful uh, to watch. Jamila, what Robert was saying about his artistry comes on this dance. I love how Judith capped the documentary by saying Alvin breathes in, right? And all that he was wrestling with, we, bring, we breathe out. Um, and I thought that was so powerful. Talk to me mm -hmm. about some of the decision points, Jamila, because my 
audience knows I prefer to talk to directors versus like the, the actors in the movies because you guys control the sequence and the way you control the edits and the sequence of everything was fantastic. I love the interplay, Jamila, of telling his story, previous company members, but then intertwining the current dance that was being set. It was almost as if every movement was in companionship to the piece I just talked about. But why was that important for you to open up with the Kennedy Center? I'm curious about that choice. Um, so the Kennedy Center, you know, does work in two ways for us. I think for, um, you know, people who are unfamiliar with Mr. Ailey or maybe not even familiar with the company coming in, it's a way of sort of signaling, um, you know, essentially his, you know, stature as, you know, an artist of the, of the, um, uh, of an, an, a, you know, exceptional American artist. Um, I think, you know, when you watch the full film, there's a way that that moment of extraordinary achievement becomes complicated and is very nuanced by the end of the film when we sort of have a full sense of all that Mr. Ely sacrificed in order to create this extraordinary company and the kind of personal, um, you know, struggles that were bound up in that. And so you really see um, I guess in some ways now I think a lot about this notion of black excellence that we have and it's interesting to think about it in the current conversation of some of our excellent, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you know, black, you know, athletes and performers, you know, there is this, this incredible burden to achieve and, and, you know, the, the sort of price that's built into that um, is certainly plays out in Mr. Ailey's story. So, um, and then, you know, the other part of it that we, that we really kind of loved was um, by using the Kennedy Center at the top of the film, by hearing the national anthem, it's a way of also cementing the fact that this is an American artist. The dances that he stages are American dances, that he and the company represent this nation, that our culture in this country is fundamentally connected to um, the Black experience. And so I think there was a way of just allowing the opening frames of the film to claim um, um, to claim something in the very way that Mr. Ailey did by naming his company, right? The Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. That is very intentional. Um, and we wanted our opening moment to kind of encapsulate all of those things. I love that. That's what I was feeling when I heard that national anthem being played, because far too often when we think about art that's created by Black people, that's only for Black people. Um, and not really realizing that the Black experience is the American experience um, and, and how much our artists and creators have to fight um, for that narrative to be pushed outside the bounds. And based upon the documentary, you guys really showcase him having to twirl with that. Um, and Robert, I love how Bill T. Jones talked about um, the burden of Black creators, right? And, and how much those who arrive to a certain point of success, whatever success means, uh, there is that Black tax. And sometimes some of the Black tax from economic and supporting our family, but for me, the Black tax is having the responsibility and the voice of your community. Um, can you talk to us about the pressure you feel as the artistic director uh, with that Black tax of you know, having cultural and history, which is what the work of Alvin Ailey is, while putting it out through the lens of American story. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, um, you know that that can be daunting at times, quite frankly. But that can also be fuel at times for for um, creativity. That friction between what is expected of one but also the conflict of, but what do I see for this company? What do, what do I see, you know? And, and so that, that notion is, is, is always sometimes there's a little conflict in that, but it kind of acts as an impetus to me to sometimes challenge the notion of what it means to carry this company forward, what you get to see on the stage, what I bring in, in terms of, you know, new choreographers and new works, but also alongside those historic works. And what kind of statement does that make about uh, this company? So it's both pushing the boundaries, but also remembering where you came from. I think that's a big part of the balancing act uh, that, and also just knowing uh, that, you know, I always say that 
yes, this is the Albany of the American Dance Theater. This is, you know, I'm the artistic director, Judith Jamison was as well, but this is in a way the people's company. You know, when people approach me and we didn't do revelations, you know, they don't approach like that was my, you know, rightful choice. <laughs> you messed up. You know? No, Robert, you, you did. It? Like, if I don't get revelation, I get so angry with the company. I feel like I'm like, why did I come? Like, why am I here? Right, right, right. right. And then when Clifton stopped, I was like, that's not fair to us, right? Like, <laughs> no one does that triple axel better than Clifton. No shots fired to the current dance. I'm so sorry, that was so wrong. I, I everyone's fantastic, right? But yeah, it was a yeah. way that his signature of his yeah. language in that piece was sickening. Uh, yeah. Bring them back, please, for a bonus one this December, preferably when I can come um, as your <laughs> guest. Thank you so much, Robert. I appreciate you. Those tickets are expensive. Um, <laughs> you said dinner, Jamila? Um, okay, cool. Got it. Uh, but Robert, I'm glad you talked in on that because I want to lean in a little bit more on that one because, you know, when you were named the artistic director, mm -hmm. you know, I was there for that transition, and, you know, as a part of the company, um, as someone who supports um, the arts, seeing that transition and, and the name of it I was wondering how did you feel um, mm. and what pressure did you feel but now that we're talking and now that I saw the documentary I'm curious did you do you feel you actually had the permission from Alvin to take the company forward with the new work that you've been creating right that you've been setting um, like four by four by four uh, for, mm -hmm. for example right because he even said Jamila you highlighted where he talked about you know the new development grabbing Bill Jones and downtown culture to help push it forward so do you feel like you kind of have permission from him um based upon understanding the spirit of him yes i do feel because he was so ahead of his time you know there's i mean of course everybody knows revelations because it's a masterpiece one of the most seen and celebrated dances ever created but sometimes we take for granted that he made many um incredible works that that were completely different from Revelations. He brought in choreographers like, like Bill T. Jones that was pushing toward that avant-garde, you know, towards um, pushing this medium called modern dance in new directions that some people loved and some people found complicated, you know, but, but Alvin Ailey wasn't afraid uh, to take those risks. I think he found joy in that and people who articulated their craft in a different way. And so in some ways he laid out the blueprint for what I'm doing as well. I think he would applaud the notion of um, challenging how people see an Ailey dancer, um, what they're capable of, the many different uh, languages in the body that they're able to house. That's mm -hmm. why he started a repertory company and not just a company of his own works so that we could have a rich tapestry um, as, as we travel the world. I think the What's other part about it that's so, I was just gonna piggyback on this a little bit because yeah. I think it's so interesting that in many ways for me, that's what we discovered in going on the journey with him was this extraordinary, almost like stumble upon that you know, an itinerant musician comes into town and he gets exposed to a certain kind of music. He goes to a juke joint and he gets exposed to a certain kind of social dance. He goes to LA and in South Central LA, he's getting exposed to all of this culture. He gets taken to the downtown theaters and he gets exposed to a different kind of culture that he wouldn't have had access to. And then with Lester Horton, he gets opened up into this world of total theater. And so to me, it's like he's replicating this wondrous experience that he has as having mm -hmm. had the great fortune of having so much exposure. And, you know, that is not true for everybody in this country. Everybody doesn't have that kind of immediate access to everything. I didn't have that access to everything. So I think when you yeah. go to Ailey and you get to see, sure, you get to see Revelations, but maybe you get to see streams. Maybe you get to see rooms. Maybe You know, like there's all these other um, kinds of dance um, languages, let's say, that he can he can hook you with revelations, but if he's got you with revelations because you know you're going to see it, he could, and the company still today, can give you like a full banquet, like a feast of dance. Um, and that is amazing. Yeah. I mean, I love how you, how you just described that um, as I was about to come to you. And that's why I know the studio is listening 
listening and they need to push heavy uh, for Oscar consideration for your, for your consideration <laughs> campaign for this, for the documentary and also too for how you directed that. Be again, like directors are my bag. And when I tell you the way that you did the sequencing of this documentary, it took me on a journey. I felt so emotional the entire time. And I mm -hmm. want to be clear, although I attend the galas and I go, I'm not an alien expert. And I think there's a lot of us who are like me, where we come, we applaud, we enjoy the after party, but we may not know the entire history of it. And so I was on a sense of discovery the entire time of not knowing. But there was something about the, you know, the way you directed the film is almost in concert to the spirit of Ailey. And I love the line where he talked about how he discovered dance with that choreographer and, and, and it said to justify your movement. Right. And I felt like in every scene that you built up for us, there was a justification previously of why you were jumping to the next scene and mm -hmm. the next segment. And I thought you did that brilliantly and seamlessly, which is why I want to lean into your selections from the repertoire, because you had so many repertoires to choose from. I mean, I don't even know the amount of dances total that they have in, their ca in the catalog there, but you nailed one of my favorite ones, right? Although I talk about Cinnamon a lot, the revelation, there is one in there that to me symbolizes Ailey. I want to get your thoughts on this and why you chose the ones you did in the film was Fix It Jesus. And I think Fix It Jesus shows, because mm -hmm. it's a tight duet uh, with this, this male and female dancer, but the athleticism, I mean, it is pure athletics wrapped in grace and beauty and that to me symbolizes Alvin Ailey at his core. So I'm curious how you chose um, the pieces to highlight in this documentary to tell the story of, of who he was. Um, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. And I would be remiss if I did not give a shout out to my team at Insignia Films and in particular, my extraordinary, just intuitive, beautiful, open, vulnerable editor, Anna Galilia, who is part of who helps me realize the kind of language of the film um, and she committed herself whole cloth. I mean, our dance selections were brutal because he's made over 70 choreographic works. And so you start the film knowing like, great, we're gonna show like this much. <laughs> um, you know, it's just like not depth. We just don't, we will just not have the time to do justice to his full body of work. Additionally, not every piece that he um, choreographed is shot on film or shot well on film. So then again, in an archival context, you're, you're kind of limited by, you know, what's available in the archive. Um, in terms of revelations, we were really listening to the words of the, the Ailey dancers who kind of bore witness to, um, to the work themselves. What I thought was so amazing once I got to know all these dancers was that they each had their own personal aha moment. You know, Mr. Ailey has his aha moment with Horton, but also with Catherine Dunham, who tells him, oh my gosh, there's possibility now on this stage. For me, I didn't become a dancer, but that evening in college was like, what is this now? You know, it just really opened me up and each of his dancers has the same experience. So we knew that in that moment, they all had their kind of, you know, revelations epiphany. And we were just listening to their words and thinking about, well, okay, what are the phrases that, you know, what are the dance moments that we can select from revelations that really give voice to um, what, what these speakers are, are, you know, talking about in terms of their experience. So in that case, it's Linda Kent, who saw them perform for the first time. She saw Mr. Ailey perform in the dance, and she saw them at Jacob's Pillow. And, you know, just she, she talks about, like, the, the kind of really full range of emotion that she was seeing, which was distinct from the kind of modern dance work she was seeing and, you know, and starting to work in at Jacob's Pillow. So this idea of people who are experiencing sorrow and joy and beauty, and we just felt like that moment of Fix Me Jesus, that duet, um, was just so beautiful. And then, of course, the way that um, Linda Celeste Sims and, and Glenn, you know, they're a couple, yes. so we get to show the married couple yes. dancing this beautiful duet. And just she I think is a her extension, yeah. Mm. I mean, I always think at the very end, she reaches and grabs his hand and her leg, go, you know, I'm not going to talk about the proper dance move, but you know, her leg goes up and then it just goes up a tiny bit higher, like a little yeah. period. And it's just gorgeous. And you feel in their 
they're stretching and they're reaching and they're in there, you know, when she, he lifts her, her kind of full release, um, there's that kind of vulnerability. I can have you, I can be cared for in that moment. I, you know, she's mm -hmm. dancing away and they're coming together. So I think it just was, I mean, we wept, like we, we laid that dance in and we just started playing with it. And, you know, we're both through, through Zoom, mediated through Zoom, just watching it play back and just weeping at, the way that, you know, it's so expressive and their particular, that perform, you know, that's the other thing, that performance on that night, because we aren't, it isn't live, right? And so we also mm -hmm. have to find the, the taped performances that are, that are extra communicating the kind of expressive um, emotion and that we just, we just loved that piece um, so much. And I'm also disappointed again, Robert, when she wasn't performing that piece and I would attend. So just so you know, uh, Robert. Uh, just disappointing you. You're all in trouble. Yeah, You're in trouble. Yeah. So, so, so Robert, basically, I don't like you. I like Jamila and not you because you brought me so much pain now oftentimes. But not consulting with me first on who what should be done that right. night and who should perform it. You I'm hear me, Robert? I'll call you next time. Yeah, yeah, let's reconcile that for the new season coming up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, but Robert, I want to talk a little bit about, I, I mean, I guess that's a kind of a perfect transition actually about the exit the pressure we alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, aside from the, the pressure of not, you know, mounting the different repertoires that people wanted to see, I, I'm just curious in this day and age, um, and Alvin always had a social construct bent, you know, to him. Jamil a little bit alluded a little bit earlier, and I'm thinking in the backdrop of like Simone Biles and our greats and the pressure and the responsibility of being great, performing at your peak, but then also to being expressive of blackness and black identity. Um, mm -hmm. As you guys are choreographing and thinking about new pieces and you know, you're thinking about the next phase of, of the new season, you know, how much of that comes to bear? And then how much of it do you have to wrestle with in the sense of the responsibility of bringing that forward or not having to think about that? Like talk to me about how you feel bound by that or not. Yeah, that's a, and and actually, you said it in the way that I think about it, and the conundrum that has always been a conflict, right? Because in some ways, the notion of freedom means that you can say what you want to say, and that there's nothing you if you're expected to say. If I want to show a dance about, a, you know, a love duet, well, that for certain people is a revolutionary act in and of itself. So sometimes it's the way people think about what they're seeing. A critic once said, we did a very intense work um, that was, you know, was sort of um, about an uprising. And it just happened to be fortuitously at the time where people were taking to the street. Um, um, because of an incident of police brutality. And, you know, we didn't know people were taking to the street because we spend all day in the theater. But a critic said that, oh, they, he felt the need, I felt the need to be political, but not mm -hmm. understanding that anything we do is political. <laughs> you know, if we make a yeah. dance about humor, it's political because that's the world in which we live. So in some ways, it doesn't take much by way of making a social statement. Just stand on that stage and tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And that is the social statement. That is the revolutionary act. And so that's kind of how I process it. And curtain call. Um, <laughs> uh, that was beautiful uh, because mm -hmm. in the piece, Jamila highlights where she talked about the information is stored in their bodies, right? And so, because the act itself is revolutionary, the dance itself is revolutionary, the information is coming out of the bodies because it's our lived experience and it's how we communicate it and it's how expressive that we are. Uh, yeah. Beautifully stated, Robert. Um, Jamila, then I want to come to you as we close because I can clearly talk to you guys all day. You guys have been a treat. Um, but I, I'm curious, the part that stood out to me, I thought was um, interesting where it, it says that uh, you, you saw the name Alvin Ailey, but you never saw the man. Um, talk to us about why that was important to be highlighted in the documentary. Because again, not only 
you had to choose from so many choreographed pieces, but you also are choosing from so many interviews. So like, why did you feel that um, was an important line to keep in there? Um, I think because just as Robert says, I think enough time has passed and the company has, um, you know, grown and succeeded and kind of become this eternal institution. I can't imagine a world, thankfully, <laughs> without um, the Ailey company. And, but I, for me, you know, I'm interested, I was interested in, okay, so what makes that possible? And knowing that when you walk into the building today, and I encourage everyone to do it, you know, it's, there is a feeling that is mystical, spiritual, I don't know what it is, but there's something that feels larger than just, this is a place where dancers work, and this is a place where you can come and take some dance classes. Um, I think that's a testament to the responsibility that, you know, anyone who works there seems to have felt to carry on the mission, and there's a kind of handing down, you know, you know, Miss Jamison takes over the company, but I feel like part of bringing Robert in was an understanding that here's a kindred spirit who is not going to take for granted the foundations. And so then I thought, well, we have an opportunity now to think about what the foundation is and to get to know that artist. And to get to know that artist means to get to know him behind the kind of pitching for the company. I mean, to me, it's, he was drawn, he was pulled to dance, right? That's what he says. Dance had started to pull at me. I love that, right? And he, and he submits to this art form and he gives everything to it. I mean, he says that, I yeah. you sacrifice everything for it. So let's talk about the things that he sacrificed and let's consider the reasons why. I think there's just an interesting tension where you know, the expressive possibilities for him as a human being were greater on stage or greater as he choreographed works than they were in the times he lived because the times he lived in were so intent on telling him that he wasn't right, okay, whatever, you know, in every way, right? And so I, I loved that, that idea. And I think you see it in the work, you feel, um, this kind of um, search for, as Mary Barnett says in the film, this idea of I am. And I think mm. the, the more I think about it, it's like, we don't, there's this thing where I thought, oh, you can think of Mr. Ailey as this icon and he makes these works and these works have a message. And so he must already have that message. And like the preacher to his disciples, he's giving us the message. And it's not like that at all. It's in fact, a person who is in search of something and makes works to work something out. And so he didn't have, he hadn't solved the, the riddle of himself <laughs> or the mm -hmm. riddle of human nature or the riddle of any of that. It's like each work is a way to kind of um, explore something in himself um, and then to stage it for the world. And I just felt like, you know, it, it matters to know that, you know, he's not just a statue on a pedestal or a poster on the wall or a name on the yeah. side of the building. I don't think anybody in the Ailey company conceives of it that way. That's not, not anything I heard of um, from the dancers. You know, the institution carries on his vision. And I just felt like for us as audiences who love and adore it, we needed the reconnect to, to the kind of foundational spirit. So well said. I mean, you guys are another career in speaking <laughs> uh, <laughs> because of storytellers. Uh, Robert, I would be remiss if I didn't give the audience a call to action because audience, if you have never seen an Alvin Ailey uh, performance, or you may not even be into dance, um, I want you to really watch this documentary. Um, as you watch this documentary, you know, there is no question I could ask that could even get to the beauty of watching brilliance in action. I, I just never thought I would see Ailey choreographing a dance in his studio. You know, artists, you know, audience were watching this is back from the Olympics and we're watching athletes compete at their highest moment. And we're also seeing the packages and the backstories. Um, mm -hmm. This is in perfect conversation with that because this is an athlete, if you will, um, operating at his highest form and giving us excellence at his highest form. And we get taken for a journey behind the curtain uh, of what it takes to create excellence. And it will blow you away, even if you're not into dance, it will blow you away of just how do you set excellence on a stage or for the public consumption? Uh, Robert, where can people 
besides making sure you go to this documentary, it's out now. It's called Ailey. Um, how, where would the company be? Would you guys be going on the road soon? Like, how can people connect um, with Ailey who may be fans and who want to know and, and may be interested in becoming a fan as a result who may not live in New York City? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've been, of course, not in live performance um, mm -hmm. since uh, March of, of last year. And so in December, we will be at City Center. We will be back. It yeah. will only be three weeks. We usually do five, but we thought, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> kind of start easy. But Revelations will be back. We will be back. And we can't wait uh, to perform for our audiences and then have them in the house performing for us. Because, you know, an alien audience, <laughs> if they don't just show up, they show out. Yeah. And I think this is going to be a, a kind of homecoming that you don't want to miss because this is unprecedented that we've been away from our audience in live theater for so long that I think people are going to be um, overwhelmed, you know, yeah. with, when the curtain goes up on, on Revelations. I agree. And make sure you have DJ MOS again to, to DJ the after party, if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> I want things the same, Robert, okay? Like, don't change that up on me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a creature of habit. Uh, with that being said, uh, Robert Battle, Jamila Wignott, thank you for you get the broader street. Thank you for bringing the Ailey story uh, to the big screen. Um, audience, make sure you go see the Ailey uh, documentary. And Jamila, thank you for putting that together in a spectacular way with you and your team. Thank you so much. Yeah, Robert, keep dancing, creating, baby. So every one of the company, uh, this stranger but super fan says hello. And, uh, <laughs> shout, shout out to Hope <laughs> and Matthew. Oh my God, everybody's amazing. <laughs> All right, bye, bye everybody. See you guys soon.